Friends, this past week I have been uh, keeping close tabs on the news and of course all of the information being sent out by uh, the CDC and the World Health Organization and even our own denomination and the annual conference with regard to COVID-19. And you know, one of the things that it always amazes me when they tell you not to touch your face, that's when your nose itches all the time. <laughs> So uh, if I do uh, scratch my nose, know that I have a, a good supply of hand sanitizers up here, uh, which I will use liberally throughout the morning. Um, but uh, just as a reminder, um, handshakes are always optional, um, especially during this time uh, when we are dealing not just with this particular illness, but with all illnesses um, here in, uh, in this world. So uh, I am continuing this story. Uh, actually, we're continuing our sermon series this morning called The Grace of Les Miserables. Uh, this uh, sermon series is based on the book written by Reverend Matt Rawl, a United Methodist pastor in Louisiana. Um, last week, we started out the series with uh, Grace Well Received, and we talked about the nature of grace. And today we are uh, transitioning into justice. Now, last week, we, we used the example of Jean Valjean, the main character of the film Les Miserables. And uh, we, we saw how he was granted grace by the Bishop of Digne, and that that grace helped to transform his life completely. Today we are looking at Inspector Javert, and, and we're looking at the, the notion of justice and grace, when those two, uh, two particular uh, uh, concepts collide with one another. And we're using an Inspector Javert as our example of that. So I am going to continue the story of Jonah, uh, which Betty read for us this morning. Thank you. Uh, and so I'm picking up the story right after um, uh, God saw that the Ninevites had repented of their sin and that God decided not to destroy the city after all. From Jonah chapter 4. <clears throat> but Jonah thought this was utterly wrong, and he was angry. He prayed to the Lord. Come on, Lord, wasn't this precisely my point when I was back in my own land? This is why I fled to Tarshish earlier. I know that you are a merciful and compassionate God, very patient, full of faithful love, and willing not to destroy. <clears throat> At this point, Lord, you may as well take my life from me, because it would be better for me to die than to live. The Lord responded, is your anger a good thing? But Jonah went out from the city and sat down east of the city. There he made himself a hut and sat under it in the shade to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a shrub and it grew up over Jonah, providing shade for his head and saving him from his misery. Jonah was very happy about the shrub. But God provided a worm the next day at dawn, and it attacked the shrub, so it died. Then as the sun rose, God provided a dry east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint. He begged that he might die, saying, it's better for me to die than to live. God said to Jonah, is your anger about the shrub a good thing? Jonah said, yes, my anger is good, even to the point of death. But the Lord said, you pitied the shrub for which you didn't work and which you didn't raise. It grew in a night and perished in a night. Yet for my part, can't I pity Nineveh, that great city? in which there are more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? May God add wisdom to the reading, hearing, and understanding of these words. <clears throat> Francesco Frank Caprio, whose image you see now on the screen, is the chief municipal judge in Providence, Rhode Island. He's a kindly gentleman who sits behind a judicial bench passing judgment on folks accused of committing traffic violations. 
Now, many cases, many of the cases that are heard by Judge Caprio are televised on a show called Caught in Providence, a low-budget version of the People's Court. I first came across Judge Caprio when one of his videos appeared on my Facebook newsfeed, and I was immediately impressed by the way he wielded justice with mercy, fairness, and grace. In one case, an elderly gentleman named William Hoffman appeared before the judge with numerous red light violations and a, a handful of parking tickets. As they talked, the judge learned that the man's wife had passed away recently and that his most egregious offenses occurred on the day that he learned she was near death and he was rushing to get to the hospital in order to be by her side. He also learned that Mr. Hoffman was broke. He had no source of income and was unable to support himself. In the end, Judge Caprio issued a fine of $100, which, by the way, Mr. Hoffman still could not afford. But what happened next was nothing short of remarkable. Judge Caprio shared with the court that from time to time, the court receives monetary gifts from people all around the country from folks who want to help others who are in need. One such gift by Mr. Ranjit Singh of Stockton, California, more than 3,000 miles away, was exactly $100, the amount of the elderly man's fine. For Mr. Hoffman, justice was served, and his fine was covered by grace. In chapter two of The Grace of Les Miserables, Reverend Matt Rawl asks the reader to consider what happens when grace and justice collide. To do that though, I think we need to establish the difference between justice and grace. Now when we talk about justice, we mean actions intended to make something right in response to an action that was wrong. The action we take depends upon the type of justice we employ human justice or God's justice. What is the difference? Well, for that, I turn to Reverend Morton Guyton, a uh, um, United Methodist pastor in New Orleans. He writes, human justice is found upon, founded upon the idea that people should get what they deserve. If someone violates the boundaries set by society's laws, that person must pay and that they must pay a corresponding debt to society. As long as people stay within their boundaries and out of each other's way, they are behaving justly in human terms. This kind of justice is called retributive justice because it requires some level of retribution. When a law is broken, the person must pay. Now, based upon this type of retribution, we believe the person deserves to pay is based upon their crime. On the other hand, Morton writes, God's justice has nothing to do with what we deserve. He writes, God doesn't want for bad people to get punished and good people to get rewarded. God wants for everyone on this planet to realize how much God loves us and to discover the unique role for which God created each of us. It is unacceptable to God for anyone to be thrown away, no matter what they have done, because God wants each of us to become who God made us to be. In other words, God's justice, also called restorative justice, focuses on the needs of all of God's people, both victim and perpetrator. Instead of just punishing the offender, restorative justice works to repair the harm that has been done and to also build or restore the relationships that have been broken as a result of the un unlawful act. And then, of course, there is grace, God's unmerited favor given to us as a gift, never earned by good deeds or by good works. Grace isn't about getting what we deserve, like in human justice. It's about getting what we don't 
deserve God's favor. And as Christians, grace is a part of who we are. It is part of our identity as believers. Now, when human justice collides with grace, well, that's when we Christians struggle. For example, going back to Judge Caprio, he could have thrown the book at Mr. Hoffman. And some of us would have been very happy about that. He could have in imposed a hefty fine and even some time in jail, given the man's numerous traffic violations. But he didn't. Instead, Judge Caprio considered the, the conditions behind Mr. Hoffman's crime. He also considered the ultimate outcomes, whether or not anyone was, was hurt by his crimes. Now, some might say the fact that the judge ruled with grace, that in that case, justice was not served. Because the man, Mr. Hoffman, didn't have to pay a penny for his crimes. He didn't have to suffer, even though he broke the law. The fact that his wife was close to death and his resulting state of mind in, the, in their eyes should not have affected the judgment. No, no, he broke the law, and the law is the law, and therefore he ought to suffer, right? Well, that's the way that Jonah felt about the Ninevites. Now, if you've never read the book of Jonah, you really should. It's very short. Um, and it's, it's not only full of theological meaning, but it's also quite entertaining. The main character is a reluctant prophet who also hates God for loving God's enemies. At the beginning of the book, God says to Jonah, get up and go to Nineveh. So Jonah gets up, but he goes the other direction. He boards a ship set for Tarsh, the city of Tarshish, which was nearly 2,500 miles away from Joppa. And while he's on the ship, he is thrown overboard by the crew, and then he is swallowed by a giant fish. Intriguing, huh? Well, while he's in the fish's belly, Jonah prays and says that he'll do whatever God wants. Now, his prayers are kind of, well, not very genuine, but he does say that he'll do whatever God wants. And so God says, okay, and makes the fish vomit, uh, Jonah out of his belly onto the dry land. Now, and then God says to him once again, get up and go to Nineveh. Now, not wanting to renege on his promise to God, uh, Jonah gets up and he goes into the city full of evil people and he proclaims to those who will listen, 40 days, before, 40 days more before Nineveh is overturned. Now, much to his surprise, the Ninevites repent and they clean up their act. And God is so impressed by this that God decides not to destroy the city after all. Well, that makes Jonah absolutely furious because in his mind, the Ninevites deserve to be punished. Obviously, God has made a mistake, right? Wrong. What Jonah doesn't get is that it is part of God's nature to extend grace to all of God's people, friend or foe. God extends grace that overturns. You see, the original Hebrew word that we read as overturn in this scripture not only means to destroy, but it also means to transform. The mere notion that God is displeased with the behavior of the Ninevites leaves, leads those evil people and their king and even their livestock to change their hearts and minds, it leads them to be transformed. But for Jonah, this just does not compute. Jonah doesn't believe that people who are evil can ever turn their lives around. They cannot be transformed. So Jonah gets angry at God and proclaims to, to God, if you're going to have compassion on these people who are so evil, if you're going to extend grace, then kill me now. I may as well just die. <clears throat> Jonah would rather die than to accept the fact that God is willing to forgive God's enemies and let them live. 
And even though God tries to help Jonah understand, and that's what the whole story about the bush is all about, Jonah can't, he just doesn't get it. His worldview will not let him understand that grace has the power to transform. And because of that, he would rather die. In fact, death would be a welcome relief. In the story of Les Miserables, Inspector Javert is a lot like Jonah the prophet. You see, he believes that those who have broken the law are evil, and they always will be. Doesn't matter what their crime is, they've committed a crime, and so therefore they are evil. Transformation for them is impossible as far as Javert is concerned. That is why we see him issue a warning to Jean Valjean, prisoner 24601. And he says to, to him, if you break the law again, I will hunt you down. Once a criminal, always a criminal. And justice must always prevail. Take a look. Now, prisoner 24601, your time is up and your parole's begun. You know what that means. Yes, he's am free. No. Follow to the letter your itinerary. This badge of shame will show it till you die. It warns you're a dangerous man. I stole a loaf of bread. My sister's child was close to death. We were starving. You'll starve again unless you learn the meaning of the law. You know the meaning of those 19 years. A slave of the law. Five years for what you did. The rest because you tried to run. Yes, 24601. My name is Jean Valjean. And I'm Javert. Do not forget my name. Do not forget me. 24601. Look down, look down. You'll always be a slave. Look down, look down. You're standing in your grave. You can see the anger in Javert's eyes. Notice that he also refers to Jean Valjean as 24601 because numbers are absolute. Names have nuance. For police inspector Javert, Pastor Matt writes, grace and justice can never occupy the same place because grace is a foolish human weakness that only destroys the justice humanity needs in order to survive. There is no room for improvisation, discernment, or compromise. There is only law or chaos, light or dark, right or wrong. For Javert, a good end can never justify breaking the rules along the way. We see this uh, in Javert throughout the film, every time he encounters Jean Valjean. The first time occurs about eight years later, after Valjean was released from prison. Javert comes face to face with his nemesis, who is now a successful businessman living under an assumed name. Javert discovers that Valjean's true identity, but he cannot see beyond the fact that Valjean has broken his parole. He cannot see that because of the grace extended by the Bishop of, of Digny, that Valjean was able to turn his life around, that he became a man of compassion, offering jobs where once there were none, and saving lives and giving money to the poor. And then years after that, when Valjean spares Javert's life, rescuing him from certain death at the hands of the insurgents during the rebellion, Javert struggles with what Valjean has done. He cannot understand why Jean Valjean would not kill him when he had the chance in order to save his own life. He just doesn't get it. He doesn't understand why Valjean would extend grace to the man who would hunt him down. 
And later, when they meet again, as Valjean is trying to save young Marius' life, Javert, like Jonah, can't take it anymore. He cannot live in a world that favors grace over retributive justice. And so, in his anguish, Javert takes his own life by falling off a bridge into the raging waters of the River Seine. How do you deal with that tension when grace and justice collide? It happens to us all the time, doesn't it? We struggle when we know we should offer grace, even though we also know that human justice, retributive justice, would be appropriate as well. For example, when a car speeds past you, going way over the speed limit, endangering your life and the lives of others on the road, we hope that they will get caught. And when they do, we hope that they'll get the book thrown at them, right? Wrong. We don't know the circumstances behind them speeding or driving inappropriately, right? Maybe they're rushing off to the hospital to be with a loved one who is near death. Maybe, just maybe, grace is more appropriate. And we know this because of Jesus. Clearly, Jesus says that we must love our enemies. We must pray for those who persecute us. We must pray for everyone and extend grace toward them, no matter what they have done. Okay, but how do we do that? How can we reconcile that with the, the grace that we should be offering with the human sense of justice that we also know is appropriate? When is it okay to bend the rules? When is it okay to choose grace over retribution? Well, once again, the answer lies in the life of Jesus and his ministry. He often bent the rules, didn't he? He chose grace over human justice. Now, don't get me wrong. He did not throw out the law. He understood it quite well. Instead, he reframed it. He turned it over. He transformed it by grace. Jesus reminds us over and over again that caring for God's people is by far more important than, than adhering to the letter of the law. If working on the Sabbath, whether to provide food for the hungry or to heal someone who is infirmed, means that that person will be transformed, then Jesus says we are to err on the side of grace. We must err on the side of the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. For when we place the law over compassion, when we place human justice over grace, we elevate the law to the point of making it an idol, leaving no room for God's intent, that all of God's people will live according to God's desire for them. Through grace, not only are our relationships restored, but real transformation can take place. My friends, choosing between justice, human justice, and grace is not easy. I know that. And I know you know that as well. We need to have laws. Otherwise, our world would fall into chaos, and chaos is not a good thing. And most of the time, we should follow the law. But sometimes, especially when we're dealing with situations that warrant a little compassion, when grace and justice collide, we should err on the side of grace. Because grace has the power to overturn. Grace has the power to transform. Amen. <laughs>